this uh, meeting to order, such as it is. Um, thank you, everybody, for making it here this morning. We have a real uh, treat, I think, in store for us today. Um, a conference that um, we've been planning for, for quite some time on is Russia undermining democracy in the West? And this conference is part of a year-long series that has been uh, run by the Andrew Mitchell Center at Penn on uh, democracy in trouble. There are a number of reasons why we should be concerned about the state of democracy in the United States, but also in other countries around the world. And we've been trying to uh, trying to generate discussion about democracy on Penn's campus throughout the year, I think, fairly successfully. And this event, we and of course, Russia is a big part of that discussion. This event is organized in um, co-sponsorship with the Foreign Policy Research Institute, which, as many of you know, is an outstanding think tank based here in Philadelphia that has a very dynamic Eurasia program. And um, we're really pleased that this uh, collaboration has resulted in uh, what we think is going to be a really strong day today um, with outstanding uh, panelists, outstanding speakers, and as we're very used to here at Penn and FBRI, outstanding audience and uh, just... Uh -huh. So, uh, without... Um, to allow to get straight into it, I'm just going to give very brief introductions of our speakers. Uh, I'm, the first to speak will be Michael Carpenter. You want to raise your hand over there? We can get her to be quite in order. Michael Carpenter is the, has been, um, he's a, a member of the Penn Biden Center, so he's a, a Penn affiliate. Um, he is, uh, had been Deputy Assistant, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia, and also uh, served in the White House as a foreign policy advisor to, uh, to Vice President uh, Joe Biden, which who he continues to advise the foreign policy advisor and uh, write excellent articles in the press um, about this part of the world. Uh, next up will be um, Samuel Sherrill, um, who is a senior political scientist, I love that title, a senior political scientist at Rand Corporation. I'm a political scientist as well, so I'm proud. Um, he is a specialist in uh, political economy and foreign policy of Russia and the former Soviet states. He previously is uh, well known for having been at the International Institute for Security Studies and the U.S. Department of State, where he was an advisor to the Under Secretary for Arms Control and National Security, and also a member of the policy planning staff. He's the co-author of a really great book um, uh, called Everyone Loses, uh, the Ukraine Crisis and the Ruinous Contest for Post-Soviet Eurasia with Tim Colton. Next, uh, sorry, I think I actually got the order wrong. Sam will speak in the third slot. Um, in the second slot will be uh, Marlene Laruel. Um, she is a, a French national. She has her PhD from Sciences Po uh, in Paris, the Institute for Political Studies. She has uh, been for a number of years now on the faculty at George Washington University in DC and uh, works with the Ponars program there. She's an outstanding uh, colleague. And I, began, I got to know her first in working on issues of uh, Russian support for the far right in Europe. Um, she is the author of um, Russian Nationalism. Um, okay, uh, well. Russian nationalism, something doctrines and political battlefields. <laughs> I can't read my own handwriting. And also a recent book on understanding Russia. She's research professor of international affairs and director of the Central Asia program at George Washington University. Finally, um, Nick Vyosev will, will speak. He is a professor, professor of national security policy at the U.S. Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. Is that correct? That's correct. And um, there he is the Captain Drew Levy uh, chair in uh, economic um, hmm, I can't geography. Remember. Geography, okay, in economic geography. And also, um, he's, he's a PhD from St. Anthony's in, in Britain. And also, I can say, uh, describe on his website in any case, as a Russian American uh, specialist. So, um, with those brief introductions, I just want to say, as a general introduction, these are some of the uh, most terrific uh, analysts, most terrific um, specialists in this area, and we've asked them to talk about um, the question of is Russia undermining democracy in the West. Uh, because of the uh, format, because we have such a great audience as well, I've asked the speakers to, to keep their initial remarks 
to about 10 to 12 minutes so that we can have plenty of time for what is always a very fruitful discussion. Of course, they can spend more time afterwards um, you know, answering questions and, uh, and, and relating to that. Um, so I would be there. I think I'll sit in the front row uh, during the thing and sort of make wild gesticulations at you when we're getting up to about 10 minutes. If I stand up, then really we're all in trouble. Um, but uh, um, I look forward to your talks, your comments, and um, then we'll find a way to moderate the discussion afterwards. Thanks so much. OK, great. Thanks, uh, Mitchell. So I'll start off um, by maybe framing the context a little bit and giving you my views. Uh, I think it's uh, indisputable that Russia is systematically trying to subvert uh, Western liberal democracies. I think it's trying to split the transatlantic alliance. And I think it's trying to undermine what we call the liberal international order. Not so much the trading aspect of the international order, not all of the aspects embedded in the UN Charter, but certainly the democracy promotion uh, and human rights norms aspects of that order that has emerged since uh, the Second World War. Now to do this, Russia has used a variety of different tools. It has used military force in the case of Ukraine and Georgia, and I do believe very much that it was uh, in large measure because these countries were nascent liberal democracies that were in the process of establishing those institutions and integrating themselves into the Euro-Atlantic community. But it has also used unconventional means. Uh, for example, in Montenegro, where the Russian GRU, the Military Intelligence Service, attempted to conduct a coup d'etat that would have assassinated the sitting prime minister uh, the same uh, fall that we held our presidential election here in this country. Which gets me to the third variety of methods that uh, Russia has used to deconstruct liberal democratic institutions, and that is what the Russians themselves call active measures. And these consist of three primary buckets of tools. The first is cyber, the second is information warfare, and the third is dark money or the weapon of weaponization of corruption, if you like. Um, these are all the tools, together with others, covert intelligence work, uh, sabotage, uh, other forms of influence operations, that Russia uses to try to undermine liberal democracies from within, often preying opportunistically on cleavages, either political cleavages, cultural, ethnic, racial, other types of divisions that exist in these societies already, but where uh, Russia sees a vulnerability and where it thinks it can exploit that vulnerability to widen those gaps, uh, to create uh, dissensus within society, to support anti-establishment candidates on the far left and the far right, or even not on either end of the spectrum, demagogic populists somewhere in the middle, uh, but who nevertheless have uh, a desire uh, to uh, take on the establishment, to take on uh, established uh, policy positions such as support for NATO, uh, such as support for the European project. Now, my view is that after invading Georgia and Ukraine, Russia, the Kremlin, has gradually come to the realization that actually military tactics are less successful than some of these more subversive measures that are harder to attribute, that are more difficult for the population to see, um, and that frankly are cheaper, more effective, and have less blowback than military intervention. In the case of both Georgia and Ukraine, Russia's military interventions in fact galvanized a greater sense of national consciousness uh, and anti-Russian feeling in both of those countries and in fact strengthened resolve within a significant uh, sector of both populations to support further Euro-Atlantic uh, integration. And so in that sense, I think uh, Putin and those around him in the Kremlin who very carefully study opinion polls and popular attitudes have come to the understanding that overt military force is actually not an effective way uh, to deconstruct liberal democracies, but rather subversive methods uh, are very effective tools. 
um, and no more effective case than the case of our uh, 2016 presidential uh, election campaign. Now, I'd like to spend a little bit of time here just at the outset uh, before turning over the floor to my colleagues to talk about what I think are the drivers of this, um, of this concerted, systematic effort to attack uh, Western liberal democratic institutions. I think this effort has progressed uh, in sort of three basic phases. The first phase, uh, roughly after Putin came to power, you can think of as an attack on the institutions and norms of liberal democracy in Russia itself. This was a period where broadcast television stations were taken over by uh, Kremlin allies, uh, civil society still existed, but was gradually being uh, repressed more and more throughout Putin's tenure, uh, and where other uh, independent checks and balances on the power of the Kremlin were gradually hollowed out. The second phase is in Russia's own, what they call near abroad, on, on Russia's periphery, uh, where, again, countries like uh, Georgia in 2008, or even before that, Estonia in 2007 uh, were attacked uh, precisely because of their uh, refusal to follow uh, the to fall into line within the Russian orbit and to pursue their own aims uh, of Euro-Atlantic uh, integration uh, and consolidation of uh, democratic institutions. The third phase, however, uh, is one that is very recent. I would submit mostly post-2014. Of course, you can find instances of this before 2014. But post-Crimea, once sort of the, the glass was broken on the emergency break, uh, Russia has really uh, decided to, to take on the West uh, systematically across all domains where it thinks it has uh, an asymmetric uh, advantage. And it has done so. Uh, across the Western democratic world. I think uh, uh, the, the primary reasons and drivers for this are, are manifold, but I'm going to identify five primary uh, drivers that I think account for this increasing, not just risk tolerance, but desire to take on uh, Western liberal democracy uh, frontally. Uh, the first uh, of these drivers is Putin's consolidation of power. Uh, which uh, is not just the consolidation of the Putin regime, but really uh, the consolidation of power in the hands of just one man. So if in the first five years of Putin's tenure, say roughly 2000 to 2005, if the Kremlin <laughs> operated as uh, uh, Kremlin Inc., uh, as, it was, as it's sometimes called, with Putin as the uh, chairman of the board, uh, that's an analogy that's been used a lot, then, um, then in more recent times, Putin has just become the committee of one. He is the sole decider. There is no one else in the Russian elite who, um, there are some who can whisper in his ear, but there is no one else who can really challenge his authority on any decision-making uh, aspect. And so whereas in an earlier period you might have had oligarchs or other people with vested interests in maintaining uh, more um, cordial relations with the West, uh, with this consolidation of power, those constituencies may still be there, but they're no longer influential uh, and they don't have a voice, uh, or at least are not able to influence uh, Putin's decisions. The, the second um, major driver, I think, is also a reconfiguration of, of power uh, uh, resources and the balance of power as it is perceived uh, in Moscow. And what accounts for this is the, the oil boom of the, of the 2000s where the Russian economy uh, grew uh, at an enormous rate thanks to oil prices that really skyrocketed from about $25 a barrel to all the way up to $140 a barrel. Um, and at the same time, you have in 2007-8 a financial crisis in the West uh, that really convinced those in the Kremlin who may have earlier thought that the West was sort of this omnipotent, invincible force, uh, that Western democracies were actually very fragile uh, and vulnerable. The third factor is um, is the sort of the fear of color revolutions and the fear of how liberal democratic norms 
could undo the legitimacy of uh, the Putin regime itself, which is, of course, is a, a factor that has always been there, but um, especially after the, the so-called winter of discontent, the protests against the Putin regime in 2011, 2012, I think this really took Putin to the core in a way that the Arab Spring and earlier protests in, um, in Georgia, the Rose Revolution, the Orange Revolution, didn't, you know, of course those were concerns, but when it came home to roost, uh, that liberal democratic norms were being invoked against the Putin regime, transparency, anti-corruption, and the rest of it. Uh, there was a concerted effort by Putin, who at the time was not only not in charge, prime minister, that when he came back, things were going to change, no more playing nice with the West. Fourth driver, and I know I have only about a minute left, so I'm going to have two more drivers I'm going to cover, and then I'll save um, the rest of the discussion for later. Uh, fourth factor is what's called the Gerasimov Doctrine, which is, uh, I think it's inappropriately attributed to Gerasimov. Uh, I think it's the Putin Doctrine, actually, uh, and not Gerasimov's. And I think too much has been made of, for those of you who are familiar with this concept, uh, of the hybrid warfare aspects of this doctrine. I don't think that's what's novel. Russia has used what we call hybrid or unconventional tactics for, uh, for decades and decades, and the Soviet Union did before the current Russian state existed. But what's new is a, uh, a shift from a sort of a mobilization uh, model or paradigm of war, where you engage in sort of preparation in the early stages before there's a conflict, and then you ramp up mobilization resources until you get to a full-fledged conflict. That model was discarded, completely thrown out the window, and was replaced with a model of continuous political warfare as a necessary, uh, as a necessary must for the Kremlin in confronting the West. And not, of course, in every domain, because Russia faces um, a disadvantage in conventional military uh, uh, capabilities. But wherever Russia has an asymmetric advantage, this new paradigm advocated for taking on the West with full force wherever, again, Russia possessed an advantage. And so those areas I, I discussed earlier, cyber, information warfare, dark money, those are areas where Russia thinks it can take an advantage of our open democratic societies, our free press, uh, our open financial systems. Finally, uh, the fifth driver, I think, is that just simply the advent of new technologies. Uh, social media is the most obvious one which Russia has manipulated to its advantage uh, in Western countries, not just here, uh, but Western Europe. Uh, but also our financial system, our post-Citizens United campaign uh, finance system, where it is so easy for foreign actors uh, to pour money into uh, what are called 501c4s, nonprofits. Um, who can in turn channel that money into super PACs and other politically active organizations with no reporting of the ultimate origin of that money. And so changes to the nature of our campaign finance, uh, social media, cyber advances have all given Russia these new tools that it is now using against us. Um, I was going to talk about the effectiveness of these tools, but since my time is up, uh, I will save that for the Q&A. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I will continue the discussion by taking the opposite perspective uh, uh, from Michael and argue that asking if Russia is undermining democracy in the West is in fact asking the wrong question. And I will briefly mention three points that I think needs to be deconstructed to uh, uh, enrich the discussion. The first point, it's a short one, but I think it's a critical one, is that the way the question is framed for these serious theoretical issues and does that help us finding a meaningful answer. The main confusion in the way the sentence that we are discussing today is formulated is that on one side it's using the terms of the West and democracy as kind of abstract archetype, it's just a kind of Weberian idea, ideal type, while we also have in the same sentence the notion of Russia and undermine that refer to very concrete actors and policies. And I think this creates a confusion of analytical levels where Russia's actions are identifiable, but democracy remains an abstract notion and rooted in any particular context. And I think that if we stop thinking about democracy as something abstract, but we look in concrete way the way democracy in the West are working, not in the theory, but in practice, 
then the, the place of Russia in it appear in a slightly, in a largely different way. Second point, I think it's also a key one, is that I don't think the real issue is Russia. I think the real issue is what we think the West is. And what is the discrepancy between this kind of abstract West and democracy that we dream to have, and the real West and the real democracy that we have in concrete here? Term. So if we are not able to include the real West in the discussion, we are kind of distorting the parameter of our discussion, and that gives the impression that Russia is acting in a vacuum rather than in interaction with the rest of the world. But Russia hasn't been undermining democracy. It's not something written in the trajectory, in the DNA of the Putin regime. It's the result of three decades of interaction between Russia and the world, and in particular the West, and from mutual interpretation and misinterpretation. So if we think the West as something, the Western system or the liberal order as a kind of absolute normativity and kind of correctness, then yes, Russia is guilty. But if we see the West, and especially the US, as being partly responsible for also weakening the international liberal order, then Russia's transgression and subversion of that order can be understood in a broader context where the notion of great power and the way great powers are using norms is blurred not only from the Russia side, but also from the Western side. And I think that on that, we have, we the West, have co-created the Russia that we have now. And so if there is any hope to transform Russia, it will also mean transforming ourselves and the way this so-called liberal uh, uh, order is functioning. My third point is that the way the question is framed, and I think that's a key element, is kind of positing the West as the passive actor, the West as the victim. Like if there was no agency in the West, that were really undermining the democracy. And I think that the key issue is that democracy is undermined in the West by Western actors. And the relationship of these Western actors to Russia is a secondary element. Russia is an echo chamber, not a driver of what is happening in the West. The trust in representative institution, in government, in traditional media, it's not a product of Russia. It's a product of our own society. The fact that social media are changing the way people interpret the legitimacy of institutional voices is coming from our own society. The role that Facebook, YouTube are playing in changing the way people frame the world, it's a product of our society, of the Silicon Valley. It's not a product of Russia. The rise of illiberal movement in Europe is grassroots. It's based on deep domestic reasons that have nothing to do with Russia. The Brexit is not a product of Russia. The electoral success of Marine Le Pen or Matteo Salvini are not a product of Russia. We don't, uh, um, the, the, sorry, the, the, the many uh, uh, EU crises that we had these last decades, I think are really the key element. And on that, the role that Russia can play should be kind of reframed because each time Russia is accused of undermining democracy, there are many more structural features that explain the phenomenon of which Russia is accused. The way Donald Trump has been elected has very few things to do with Russia and a lot to do with the dysfunctionality of the US political system. As I said, the current polarization of public opinion in Europe is mostly due to, to Facebook, Google, and YouTube. You can look at the recent research showing that YouTube's algorithm support polarization and conspiracy theory. You don't need to have Russia uh, uh, there to kind of create that phenomenon. That right, if you think that Russia, I mean the idea that Russian media by heavily promoting illiberal figure and movement contribute to create that, I think it's a kind of magic thinking. It's not because Russian media are reporting on something that they are creating these things. Another also kind of example of false reasoning that we have in this kind of triangulation. It's not because the European far right are, for example, supporting the Yellow Vest protest in France, and that these far right people are pro-Russian, that it means that Russia organized the protest, right? So this triangulation doesn't work. It's a, it's a, 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 a fallacy in what we, uh, in, to use a, a rhetorical uh, vocabulary. The last point that I wanted to do, to say is that the Russian media ability to change public opinion in other countries remains to be demonstrated. We don't have scholarly evidence of that. What we have 
if an, an, an analysis of the tools Russia has been using and its intentionality in changing the framing, but we don't have any proof that the Russian media can change the European public opinion. What we know is that Russian media are watched mostly by people who are already no more mainstream people, but already belong to kind of marginalized, far-right, mostly partly far-left uh, 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 groups. So I think it's really important to dissociate the desire to influence with the ability to undermine and let alone to modify the political system of a foreign country. So three very brief conclusions. Does Russia intend to undermine democracy in the West? Yes, because the Kremlin consider that the international liberal order is dysfunctional and going against its own, own interest, and because it cannot confront it globally, openly, then is attempting to weaken it by using the tools it has at its disposal. Does Russia have the tool to undermine democracy? It has some, and Michael mentioned several of them, cyber attack, information warfare, activation of proxy. I think on many of these cases, the Russia tools kit is in fact is innovative, it's low cost, it's good for a weakened uh, Russia that cannot afford too much of kind of uh, uh, military uh, uh, action. But it's also a thing that we are projecting Russia as being strong on that because we are projecting ourselves as being weak. I don't think we are. And last point, is Russia succeeding in undermining democracy in the West? I think no. First, because we have no scholarly evidence that it has succeeded in undermining democracy. And second, and that's my main point, because I think we are conflating Russia's supposed success with structural and on-road changing that are occurring within Western democracy themselves. And so what I think is the central point is that it's not Russia the problem, it's our lack of introspection on how the West and democracy are challenged structurally and internally. And I will stop here. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so I want to make uh, three points. Um, first, uh, to uh, follow on a bit with, uh, with Marlene's remarks uh, and to somewhat further question the question, or specifically one of the few words that Marlene uh, didn't, uh, didn't address in that question. Um, second, a few quick thoughts on uh, how we might go about determining what Russia's intentions um, uh, with its interference efforts in U.S. politics actually were and are. And then perhaps slightly third, going beyond our mandate here, and uh, address the question of how uh, we might think about um, making this stop, whatever we consider this to be. Um, so first I want to argue that uh, Russia, the term, the word and the question, is as slippery as uh, any of the others that um, uh, Marlene identified. Presumably by Russia we mean uh, the Russian government, its multitude of intelligence, its multitude of intelligence agencies, um, and Presumably we also mean government-friendly private entities like uh, the uh, famous internet research agency, the Troll Farm, that, uh, that has been uh, received so much press. Presumably we also mean state-funded media, um, of which there are many. Uh, and so we're already into a double-digit count on, on actors, as far as I can tell, when we, have, when we use the term Russia for uh, what we're referring to. And so in acknowledging that multitude of actors, we're compelled to sort of look inside the, the black box of uh, decision-making in Russia and um, policy implementation. And I should caveat this analysis by saying that ultimately, uh, and here um, uh, I think I agree with Mike, that uh, President Putin does have the power to turn off pretty much any activity that we would uh, find problematic under the banner of interference, and uh, therefore nothing that I, should, uh, that I will say should detract from his ultimate responsibility for uh, the actions that, uh, that did occur. Uh, he was certainly made aware of U.S. concerns um, uh, by, among others, uh, the President of the United States at the time, uh, and did not take steps to stop the ongoing activities that, that were identified as problematic. However, I, I would also say that that does not mean that Putin himself ordered all the actions that we've seen in 2016 uh, um, in terms of uh, the interference in, US pol in, in the U.S. Uh, election. And from what we know about how the Putin system works, there are multiple competing uh, centers of power uh, and state institutions that often operate with little uh, or no central coordination. Um, Putin can certainly push things quickly through when he throws his support behind an initiative, um, but on most issues, as far as we understand, he takes no strong position, and the outcome is often determined by the clash 
of these competing interests and bureaucratic actors. And so this is a paradox, because clearly we have a highly centralized authoritarian system, but because of the relatively weak institutions, um, uh, the extent to which that centralization produces uh, a coherent decision-making process that can be implemented from the top down is, uh, is limited. Putin clearly has the final say on decisions of strategic importance. But how many decisions taken by uh, the government or all the other entities we have in mind when we say the term with the word Russia, reach that level of strategic importance? 5%? 10%? I mean, clearly, uh, we don't know for sure, but certainly not the majority. Uh, and for sure, in my view, not decisions about, for example, the tactics employed uh, in the context of uh, the interference efforts in 2016. Further, there is no well-oiled process to bring questions up for Putin's decision or to effectively implement the decisions that he does make. And how do we know this? Well, Putin himself complains about it all the time, uh, specifically about his decrees not being implemented by his own government. Um, and more empirically, the, government, the Russian government's own audit chamber has stated, for example, that only 30% of the measures ordered by Putin in response to the 2014 economic crisis in Russia were effectively implemented. Um, and we know that institutions and individual actors are constantly either trying to guess what he wants or to create fait accompli uh, that they know Putin will be loath to walk back once they're created. Um, and there's also a degree of experimentation within the Russian system and as we would use the expression, throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks. So that suggests that there is rarely um, any issue, and speaking broadly now, not just about the interference question, um, a coordinated comprehensive strategy implemented in, in use and across the various arms of the state and uh, pseudo or parastate institutions. And those are general observations about the Russian system. Um, and what do we know about the specific case of uh, interference in the US election in 2016? Well, um, in the published intelligence community assessment, uh, there, uh, the, we, we learned that the, the intelligence community assesses with high confidence that Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered an influence campaign in 2016 aimed at the US presidential election. And having served in government, uh, I have a lot of respect for the intelligence community, but as a social scientist, of course, I cannot really uh, take it on faith that, that is what they're telling me is true, um, particularly when it's an assessment. And I would also say that ordering a campaign does not mean that Putin signed off on the implementation strategy. And we have some other evidence to suggest that this was not a coherent all of government effort. We know, for example, from the reports on the hacking of, DNC, of the DNC in 2016, that two Russian hacking teams, allegedly linked with different Russian intelligence agencies, were operating inside the systems at the same time without apparent knowledge of one another, let alone coordination. And we also know that, uh, based on the published indictments, that the U.S. government was able to monitor the uh, Internet Research Agency's activities very closely, as has been revealed. Um, and nowhere, however, in those indictments, we see an indication that there was a clear order issued to carry out the operation that was issued from uh, the Kremlin. So, uh, if you argue that the entire 2016 uh, interference operation was coordinated and controlled from the top, you have to assume that this operation, this effort, uh, are unique in the current practice of Russian governance. Um, that Putin was more intent on controlling implementation of this order, for example, than he was on controlling implementation of his own socioeconomic program domestically. Um, so what does all this mean? Well, it suggests that I think we need to be careful about deducing uh, the Russian leadership's objectives from observations uh, about the behavior of specific Russian actors. Um, so my second point is, actually, I'm going to try to do what I just said we should be really careful about, that is, deduce Russian objectives from uh, Russian behavior as best I can, being careful. Um, so what was, in fact, Russia trying to accomplish in 2016? Was it trying to help elect a candidate with foreign policy positions remarkably close to its own and hurt one perceived as hostile to Russian interests? Or was it attacking democracy itself? And I think that's the key question. Um, to make the case that Russia sought to undermine democracy with its behavior, we have to start with a couple of assumptions. Um, first, that the Russian elite believes that the U.S. is a true democracy. Um, and second, that they believe that the regime type of the United States, regardless of the specific, uh, specifics of U.S. foreign policy, represents a threat to Russia. And so, one thing to keep in mind about the Russian elite is that it's a deeply cynical group. Um, both about uh, uh, life in general and democracy in particular. Um, and they tend to believe, uh, based on what they say at least, that it's a smokescreen for a more sinister 
elite-dominated system in this country and in other countries that call themselves democracies. And in order to seek to undermine something, you have to believe, uh, logically, that it exists. And I'm somewhat dubious on that score as to whether the Russian elite, in fact, believes that. Second, if it is, in fact, democracy, per se, that is the problem, presumably Russia would be attacking democratic institutions globally. Um, for example, in the world's largest democracy, India. Um, but we do not see Russian interference efforts there. Uh, and um, in terms of what we know about Russian behavior in 2016, uh, can we see signs that Moscow is trying to do things above and beyond affecting the outcome of an election to skew it in a way that is favorable to its interests? To be clear, from my perspective at least, even that is the unacceptable behavior. We should try to uh, prevent it and perhaps uh, respond severely to it, but it, it does suggest motives that have less to do with the nature of our political system and more to do with the nature of the candidates who are running for office. In other words, was Moscow merely trying to affect the outcome of a political process or to attack the process itself? The short answer uh, is that it's very difficult to say uh, definitively. Almost all of the activity that took place during the, uh, the election campaign can be understood as an effort to support one candidate over the other. Um, and even the efforts to play on social divides within the U.S. seem to mimic tropes, of course, employed by one of the candidates for the presidency. Um, now, it's true that the uh, activity of the Internet Research Agency continued after the election was over and that many of those social media posts um, that have been published had no plausible link to Russian foreign policy priorities and Russian interests, and they certainly weren't linked to an election given that the election was already over. So uh, the race focused ones, for example. So clearly at least one of the actors in the Russian system had a mandate to continue efforts that suggest motives that go beyond merely affecting outcomes of elections. But even there, there are plausible explanations for the observed behavior besides an effort to undermine US democracy per se. For example, Russia might have been trying to exacerbate social divides so as to make the U.S. more inward-looking, wanting U.S. foreign policy activism that Russia finds so troubling. Um, the effect might have been to contribute to the undermining of our democracy, um, but at most Russia was playing a marginal role in that dynamic, and its intention seemed less about undermining democracy and more, um, in this interpretation at least, about pursuing its, uh, its interests. But getting back to my first point, any uh, observations like that need to be considered tentative. Um, since we cannot draw definitive conclusions about particularly the leadership's objectives from the actions of one organization. <laughs> so, finally, uh, and I think I have a couple minutes left, perhaps? Um, two uh, minutes. Two yes. minutes, all right. So, how, thinking about how we make this uh, stop. Um, so, I think it's clear uh, that we've seen that uh, since uh, the election is already over, um, this is a, uh, a fact of life, really, uh, that has not, uh, has not completely um, gone away. We have not seen the kind of massive hack and leak operations that were the real, uh, uh, most, arguably the most significant elements of the, of the 2016 operation, but uh, some of the social media um, activity has clearly continued, and therefore I think we need to think seriously about how it might be addressed. Now, I think there are a number of uh, uh, measures that have been recommended in fields that I am not expert in, but all sound very reasonable to me, like making our election systems more secure, better regulating uh, social networks, and so on. Uh, and it seems to me that sanctions are certainly justifiable uh, in a number of cases. Um, but it is my view that no matter how good our defensive measures and how punishing our sanctions, um, a capable cyber adversary like Russia, will always be able to interfere in this information age in our domestic politics if it wants to do so. It's just not very difficult. It's a low-cost operation uh, and, uh, and seemingly uh, almost impossible to completely defend against. That's not saying we, should, we shouldn't try, of course we should, but for it to completely go away, Russia will have to exercise some degree of self-restraint. Uh, we'll have to choose to rein in these actors that I've described. And the, the question then becomes, how do we get it to do so? Um, and uh, I think it's pretty clear that we're going to eventually have to get to a point where we have mutual, uh, uh, where, where we negotiate rules of the road for mutual self-restraint in this arena and be willing to give something in order to get something. We know from press reporting that Russia has sought such a negotiation on rules of the road, 
Um, and perhaps understandably, uh, there was no interest on this side of the, uh, of, uh, the relationship for that kind of a uh, discussion in 2017. Um, but I think eventually we're going to have to uh, um, come, return to that question if we want to ensure that, uh, that these kinds of episodes that have occurred uh, in 2016 and beyond do not reoccur in the future. Thank you. Uh, well, Chris. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, what I'd like to do is to try to put us into the shoes of the Kremlin, or at least of Kremlin thinkers, as to why they would engage in this type of activity. So what I'm going to lay out is not really, certainly not my own opinions or my own preferences, but an attempt to try to think through uh, what has motivated uh, the Russian side to do the things that we've observed and of which uh, they have been accused. With that in mind, I think we have to, a starting point has to be to understand uh, the relative consensus within the Russian elite about Russia's grand strategic agenda in the world. And that is a Russia that is an agenda setting power, uh, that has influence in what happens in world affairs, is not ignored or marginalized uh, consistently. Uh, the idea that Russia has some sort of special status within the greater Eurasian space to uh, organize that as its zone of privileged interests, uh, that it has this role of global involvement. And finally, uh, if Russia sees itself as an agenda setter, uh, it also rejects uh, agenda taking. That is, it doesn't want other powers, starting with the United States, to be able to critique, interfere in, set rules, or how Russia ought to govern itself either internally or externally. So that's, that's the starting point of the, of the Russian leadership. They view the international system in zero-sum terms. There are winners, there are losers, there are agenda takers and agenda setters. Uh, you are either imposing an agenda or an agenda is being imposed on you. Uh, it's a different view, certainly, than uh, the view uh, in the Euro-Atlantic community of the type of international order that we want, but that's a reality that we have to, to accept. With that in mind, <coughs> the way that the Kremlin looks at the world and looks at other countries, I would argue that the form of government in other countries is not the starting point for evaluating its relationship. It is whether or not a country, a partner, an adversary, facilitates or retards the Russian strategic agenda. Right now it happens that a majority of the countries, the leading countries that resist the Russian agenda happen to be liberal democracies, while a number of the countries which enhance the Russian agenda happen to be authoritarian. I would argue that there's a bit of a chicken and egg uh, issue here, that uh, it is the sense to which governments are supportive of the Russian agenda, which is the Kremlin's key metric less about how they are governed, although there are issues that uh, liberal democracies may bring uh, to the table. So the question as we're evaluating for the day is, is, is Russia undermining liberal democracies for the sake of undermining liberal democracies, or is it trying to strike at governments and interests in countries that happen to be democracies, or some mix of the two? And I think the more that we can bring some clarity to that question, it helps us to be able not only to understand the problem, but then to get at possible solutions. I think it's important uh, as we look at this question also to note that while governments that are authoritarian in the world, starting with China being the, the, the premier example, uh, tended to be cooperative uh, with the Russian state, uh, there are a number of authoritarian leaning or democratic backsliding countries that because they are backsliding on democracy does not make them more pro-Russian. So I think up front we have to put forward what I would call the Polish exception. Uh, Poland over the last five years has seen massive uh, backsliding in terms of its commitment to democracy and to liberal values. At the same time, Poland has become more anti-Russian. Uh, the fact that Poland is more authoritarian today does not make it uh, more Kremlin friendly, nor does the Kremlin look at the current law and justice uh, administration in Poland and say, well, because it is less democratic and less liberal, it therefore is more friendly to Russia. In fact, Russia had a better relationship with Poland uh, under the Tusk administration when it was more liberal and more democratic. So uh, Russia doesn't automatically see the authoritarian 
uh, governments are necessarily friendlier to Russia. Again, it is, uh, they start from this uh, concept of the interests. Similarly, to the extent that there's been democratic backsliding in Georgia and Ukraine, uh, that has not made either of those countries more pro-Russian. Uh, the extent to which President Poroshenko in the last year, year and a half, has moved in some increasingly authoritarian tendencies has not led to any reconciliation uh, with Russia. Uh, when Georgia has its ups and downs with uh, democratic values, uh, Georgia remains pretty committed to uh, leaving the Russian orbit. And I think it's important to, to put that, these exceptions out front, otherwise we can fall into a simplistic narrative of axis of democracies and axis of authoritarians. There are authoritarian states that Russia does not like. Similarly, uh, there are democratic states that Russia gets along quite well with, although as we're going to see, uh, and as uh, Sam already alluded to, these tend to be democracies in the non-Western world, which is why the title of this conference, this geographic focus of the conference, is important. Uh, because the track record is, is that Russia does not appear to be interfering in uh, non-Western democracies. Uh, I work in open sources, there may be highly classified material out there that suggests otherwise, but there's no evidence to suggest that the Russians have played any role in uh, elections in Japan, in Korea. Uh, there was testimony uh, in front of the Senate this past year that asserted that there would be a Russian effort to interfere in the Indian elections, but the Indian sources deny that that is occurring. Now that could either be because India doesn't want to raise this as an issue, uh, they, or that it's, it's not occurring. Uh, there was an assertion that in the uh, run-up to the elections in Brazil uh, that some of the uh, anti-fascist groups in Brazil had some connection with Russian bots, but again, uh, one incident, uh, but there was no pattern of, of anything like what we've seen Russian efforts in the United States or Britain or France or Germany in the run-up to the Brazilian election. And so, is there a reason for this? I would argue that non-Western democracies uh, tend not to view democracy as universal. They usually see their forms of government as sui generis to their own particular society. They don't export their model. India does not export a model of Indian democracy outside of India. Japan does not export a model of Japanese democracy outside of Japan. Uh, these countries tend not to assess their relationship with Russia or with other countries based on whether or not they share common political values. They tend to uh, be, conduct their uh, affairs with Russia on much more realist considerations of trade, economic advantage, security, balancing, and the like. Most of the, particularly in the southern world, most, even if countries are democracies, they tend to be very, as we would term it, neo-Westphalian. They're very jealous of sovereign prerogatives, uh, which aligns well with this Russian view about rejecting agenda setting coming in from the West. Uh, India certainly is, a, is one of the main leaders in uh, aggressively defending uh, state sovereignty. Uh, and so in that sense, uh, Russia does not interfere or does not, is not incentivized to interfere in some of the democracies of the non-Western world, in part because Russia perceives no threat from those systems. Also, in most cases, there's a predictability. Uh, when one looks at India or Brazil or Korea or Japan, uh, whichever party wins or loses an election, their policies towards Russia tend to remain pretty consistent, either from India, which has a close partnership with Russia, to Japan, which has a somewhat uh, off-again, on-again relationship with Russia, economic development on the one hand, but the islands dispute on the other. Uh, but that is something that any Japanese politician, so there's no incentive to want to back one particular political party or movement over another because the parameters of the relationship with Russia is pretty well set. So if that's the case, that and, and this conference does call us to look at this question of the West. Is there something about Western democracies? And here we're talking about the democracies of the Euro-Atlantic community. And I would argue that it's a mix. Part of it is, in fact, that uh, leading countries in the West have tended to resist or oppose Russian strategic plans for Eurasia. We stand, we, the 
Certainly the, the NATO allies stand for an open door in Eurasia. We don't believe in spheres of influence. Uh, we don't believe in uh, any type of uh, special relationship or rights that Russia has vis-a-vis uh, -vis its immediate neighbors. Uh, and so therefore that brings us into uh, a conflict uh, with Russian strategic priorities so that undermining or affecting Using this as uh, Marlon pointed out, it's a low-cost way to uh, to strike back if, if they view the Russian side views uh, Euro-Atlantic activity in the Eurasian space as a threat to Russian interests. Then this is a way to uh, in even the score. To the extent that in Western countries, but particularly in the United States and Britain, lesser extent some of the other European countries. Uh, we view democracy not simply as a sui generis form of government that suits only our own nation, but in fact as universal applicability. And in fact, we rely on that universality of democratic norms as a key tool to legitimize our own system. Uh, then undermining that serves a strategic goal. Uh, you want to try to say either democracy doesn't work, or Sam, pointed out it's just really a cloak or a smoke screen for elite interests uh, and this is a way to uh, to strike at that to the extent that with the exception and again an important exception of Armenia color revolutions in the former Soviet space tend to bring the power of governments that want to then move further away from Russia in a uh, strategic sense uh, and if you look at who the primary countries are that are interested in that. Again, the non-Western democracies really are not major players in the global democratic movement. It is the Western countries, it's the United States with its national democratic and international republican institutes, uh, in Britain, in France, in Germany with the Stiftungs that are working to advance democratic values beyond their borders. Uh, and so if the perception has been that Color revolutions are strategic losses for Russia. Again, the Armenian case is a very interesting one that's unfolding. It's the first time we've had a color revolution in the former Soviet space that has brought to power a government that is not seeking, or at least its stated claim is not to move away from Russia in terms of its strategic alliance. So if there's this perception then that uh, the West's activities in support of universal democratic values represent a strategic threat to the Kremlin, and striking at the heart of those values is a strategic, not an ideological point. Finally, we also have, I think, an interesting way to test our thesis, and I will use this to wrap up. Two smaller democracies in, in Southern Europe, Cyprus and Greece. Uh, again, no evidence at any point in the last 30 years that Russia has ever interfered in Cypriot democracy. For years, Russia never interfered in Greek democracy until the current Greek government began to take steps which uh, Russia perceived as a strategic threat, particularly the normalization of relations with Macedonia, which has cleared the way for Macedonia to enter NATO. Then we began to see Russian activity in Greece uh, akin to what we've seen in other European countries. So my concluding point is that I think that there may be some degree of ideological components to striking at Western democracy, but I think fundamentally the Kremlin still sees this as a strategic tool meant to pursue strategic interests rather than ideological ones. Thank you. Uh, thanks for those really tremendous um, uh, comments. Uh, as you can see, there's a a great diversity of opinion. A lot of points were brought up. They're very astute. Um, I, I do want to say a couple things before we jump into a discussion. Uh, I realize that I forgot to introduce myself. Um, <laughs> I'm Mitchell Orenstein, and I am uh, chair of the Russian and East European Studies Department here at the University of Pennsylvania. So, uh, welcome. And uh, I should also mention that my department is also co-sponsoring uh, this, uh, this fine event today. In particular, I believe that we're co-sponsoring the lunch, um, which is sort of on the program as a lunch break. Uh, but in fact, as far as I know, uh, we're expecting to have a buffet lunch here served at 11.30. And um, I'm going to be waiting with bated breath throughout the discussion to see if that actually happens. Um, but I do, I do anticipate that, and you should too. Um, I would like to, at this point, just um, 
uh, just uh, uh, beginning question and answers. There, there were a lot of great, uh, great perspectives here. Um, it's great that we have uh, really diverse and interesting views on the panel, and I'm sure we do in the audience as well, so don't hold back. Uh, ask some questions. In the back, and we'll wait for a microphone to reach you. Um, that is both for the reason of so that everybody in the room can hear you, but also because we are recording this, and um, we probably will post the podcast as well. Okay, uh, my question is for Mr. Carpenter. You said in a McClatchy article in 2017 that Russia's social media activities in the 2016 election were aided by U.S. individuals. Do you still stand by that conclusion? I do. Um, I think that the, as we, of course we're gonna learn a lot more post Mueller report, which is likely to be imminent. So I think, uh, you know, at this point, it's uh, a little premature to, to go into this until we have all the data uh, at our fingertips. But I am convinced that the, specifically the micro-targeting aspect of Russian disinformation in the 2016 campaign uh, was aided and abetted by people on the ground here. Uh, and you know, there's now news that polling data was passed, from, proprietary polling data was passed from the Trump campaign via uh, what for all intents and purposes is a Russian intelligence agent, uh, Konstantin Kalimnik, uh, is noted in the Mueller indictments as having ties to Russian intelligence. Well, in, in my view, and uh, I didn't work on this issue of governments, so I'm not speaking from any kind of insider perspective, but when the US government says someone has ties to Russian intelligence, they are effectively a Russian intelligence agent. And so why would he be passing or privy to campaign, proprietary campaign polling data, unless that was for some purpose. Um, and then of course the New York Times has reported that, that data was in turn passed to two Ukrainian oligarchs, Renat, uh, Renat Akhmetov and uh, Sepi Lubochkin. Um, I don't know what intrinsic interest they could possibly have in uh, insider US polling data, unless they too were conduits uh, passing that on to, to folks in Russia who then use that information in order to be able to micro-target. So I stand by that uh, statement very much. Yes, gentlemen on the side. Okay. My, my question is quid pro quo. To what extent, particularly in cyber and social media, are the Russian actions to undermine democracy in the West responsive to American actions to uh, undermine uh, illiberal totalitarianism in Russia. And to what extent is that true pre, let's say, 2015, 16, and to what extent is that true today? Right, so is, is this a comeuppance, I guess? Anyone want to take that on? Sam, people are looking at you. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I think I'd reframe the question. You know, the I think we get we get into a trap if we we uh, start looking at this in terms of um, uh, blaming responses to previous policies for um, or blaming the, the original policies for the response to it, um, you know, there's a, there's a limited extent to which one state can control how uh, long-term other states might respond. But I would say that is this, that clearly, uh, uh, beginning in 2014 particularly, the Russian government, uh, and although this started a little bit before that, is firmly convinced that the U.S. government is trying to overthrow it. Right, um, and uh, th that is the, the view of the uh, Putin and the people around him, um, and that is the cause for a lot of their uh, threat perception vis-a-vis -vis, um, the U.S. and the West more broadly. Uh, that I think has made them more inclined to take more assertive steps vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. once they perceive that effort to undermine their regime, government, whatever. Um, which, of course, I think they conflate with uh, the country's own national security to uh, um, uh, to respond to, to those steps to undermine it, uh, as they saw it. So, um, 
and maybe in part that could explain why you see things after 2014 that you don't see before 2014. Um, Russia certainly had the cyber capabilities to mess around in our elections in 2012. Uh, we didn't see it then. Um, or in 2008, frankly. Um, so I think uh, the fact that it did begin after this broader um, breakdown in relations, and not just the breakdown in relations, but also the, the, the significantly um, uh, escalated confrontation between the US and Russia um, uh, is indicative of uh, something. It tells us that at least uh, it was a response to the broader environment in which uh, Russia was operating. Can I just, um, Sam, I'm Sam, just to add to that, so I think another, and your point about why 2016 instead of 2012 or 2008 is important, and this has implications for 2020. Uh, what I'm reading and hearing is that increasing, in 2008 and in 2012, there was always people within the Kremlin establishment who thought that you could salvage some degree of the U.S.-Russia relationship, it could be improved, and now the thinking across the Kremlin is there's no, there's no government in the U.S. under current, the way that the U.S. is currently configured that we can have a relationship with, that will meet our strategic goals, as I outlined them, my own presentation, and therefore we have nothing to lose by interfering, and in fact, if this creates more problems for the U.S., that's fine. So the extent to which, you know, if you have a feeling in the Kremlin, and this also goes to the question about sanctions and other things, that there's nothing you can do to improve the U.S.-Russia relationship, and you can create problems for the U.S., definitely incentivizes the Russians to, to continue doing this for 2020. Uh, in a way that they, even if they had the capabilities in 2008 or 2012, they <coughs> were still hoping, uh, hoping for some change in the relationship in a way that they're writing it off now, which makes the European case a little different because they're splitting key European partners from the United States, partly what the Russians have done, partly what we've done. We've done a lot to also split ourselves from our European partners. Uh, and so then having the Russians do things in Europe which are designed to undermine less their own systems but their credibility and trust in the United States, that the U.S. is a bigger problem. And, you know, when you get polling data in Germany that says the U.S. is now a bigger problem in Germany than Russia, it gives the Russians something to work with. <laughs> okay, uh, we'll take another question. This man in the aisle. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> oh. You turn yours off with the Oh, is that true? Yeah. Oh, that is the other way around. So if you don't want to hear questions, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. This is Nicholas. Um, would you explain um, what you mean by um, what people mean by the color revolution and why that's, how do you get to be called the color revolution and why is the Armenia an example of that? Anyone else in the who wants to jump in on this? I mean, the, the shorthand of a color revolution is where you have a long entrenched political elite that is displaced by popular protests, that that elite is irresponsive to public needs, and it usually occurs in the context of an election that the populace, a level of fraud in the election that the populace is no longer willing to accept. Uh, and so in each of these cases where we've had color revolutions in Ukraine, in Georgia, Kyrgyzstan, now in Armenia, uh, there was a sense of a, a leader who had lost support in manipulating elections in order to just try to stay in power, and people kind of hitting a point of saying, or, or a leader doing things that went against the, the popular, uh, popular will to a point where people were willing to risk life and come out and protest. So that's, I think, the shorthand, certainly from our perspective. The Kremlin views color revolutions as insidious plots that the people power that we see, right, people in the square, flags, all of that, is from, if you talk to Russian officials, they'll say that's, that's window dressing. The real issue is splits in the elite and manipulation and 
usually, you know, discussion of Western conspiracies to, to undermine the cohesiveness of the state, and then you have these the things for the cameras and people come out. And, and generally, again, up till this past year, the Russian reaction was every time a color revolution seems to happen in the former Soviet space, it always seems to, to be directed against Russian interests. And that when color revolutions that might have been less beneficial to Western interests, say in Azerbaijan in 2006 and elsewhere, those color, and or Moldova, those color revolutions don't seem to happen. Uh, and so what makes Armenia interesting is that you had a long, you had the Sobkisyan, uh, essentially a younger generation of Armenians tired of corruption and, and stagnation in the political class saying we don't want this leadership still in there and a new younger leadership being brought under the backs of popular uprising but that younger leadership is not necessarily inclined to change Armenia's relationship with Russia. They're trying to negotiate how can we have a new more democratic Armenian government that can still retain its relationship with Russia. That's why I think it's an interesting exception uh, to look at. Uh, because that, that will upend this narrative that color revolutions automatically, in the former Soviet space, automatically change the geopolitical orientation of the country. So Who applies the name color? Who, do they pick a color? Well, I mean, this, this, this came out of, this came out, I mean, the first quote-unquote color revolution was the one in Serbia in 2000. And, and it was the people, because people either chose, there was a color of a political party, or in the case of Georgia, it was the use of the rose, so it was less that it was a color, it was a flower, but because rose can be both a flower and a color. In Ukraine, uh, Yushchenko's movement had orange as its political color, and so it, it took that. The attempt in Russia in 2011 protests, and this goes back to uh, Sam's point about the paranoia of the Putin government that you know the wet, uh, United States is out to get it, and you had the movement in 2011, the white ribbons, uh, to protest election fraud. So, and in Lebanon, it was cedar, uh, and again, that was more the tree, but because cedar can also be a, so, and then we, we applied the, the shorthand of color revolutions, because each of these movements has either a plant or a, a color associated with it. <laughs> or something, some other thing. Or something, that's how we get the uh, tool. Okay, sorry, can, can I just follow yeah. up on, on one point there, which is that, um, I mean, it, it, I have noted the same sort of thing, that this, the, the Armenian episode looked like, you know, that it wasn't good, that they were going to break with Russia, but the, the reason, for me, it was very simple. Is that it's Nagorno-Karabakh, right? Is that Armenia has, and it's probably well known within Armenian society, they have such a level of dependency on Russia to guarantee uh, their continued hold over Nagorno-Karabakh. But even the democratic revolution in that country was not going to actually break with Russia simply for national security reasons. Is that is that your opinion as well? To, to some extent, I think that 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 uh, dependency, Armenian security dependency on. Uh, on Russia is there also because the sense that the United States would not pivot quickly to replace that. It, I mean, we're not going to be in a position to offer those kinds of guarantees to the Armenians. It, and um, okay. so I think that, and again, it kind of points to that sometimes it's not ideology, it's security. Again, as a realist, I always look for the power, power politics issue rather sure. than ideology. Before, before we just because I have a difference of opinion, let me let me express it on this. Uh, I, I fundamentally disagree. I think that I think Pashinyan's revolution is going to be very interesting to see how it plays out precisely for the reasons that have been identified. But I would be shocked if Armenia is somehow, and I think it's very unlikely, but if somehow this uh, regime is able to now uh, deal with kleptocracy and establish a true liberal democracy. If Russia stands by with its military base in Gurmi and all the leverage that it has over that country and does nothing, I will be shocked. Um, because fundamentally, I think it, it may, I think we're missing the point that the semantics here are wrong. It's not ideology that Russia is concerned about. It's the threat to its system of governance, which is based on corrupt, kleptocratic authoritarianism. That's why liberal democratic institutions are a threat to Russia, okay? So no, it's not just a uh, balance of power, realism, and uh, you know, the accumulation of forces in different countries. It is fundamentally this normative driver as well, which is a challenge to the Russian ruling class. And so if Pashinyan uh, is able to do the almost impossible, I mean, you, 
Armenian uh, business is about as corrupt as any country in the world, uh, and all Armenian oligarchs are dependent on ties to Russia, literally all. Um, uh, you know, if he's able to reform that system, I think that'll be a pretext for the Kremlin to go in and, and shake things up. Now, if he is able to have a democratic transfer of power, as he has had from the previous president, Serge Sarkisyan, uh, now to Nikol Pashinyan, uh, but the system remains corrupt, uh, as it has been for decades, um, then no change. Then, then Putin doesn't need, he, he fears nothing. Uh, because he has a military base in Germany, because he has the leverage over Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, as was mentioned by Mitch. I'm going to recognize uh, Claire. Do you still have your hand you up? Know, or my not? topic was exactly this one, so it's a, a good follow-up uh, that what Mike was just getting at. Um, I wanted to hear more about the relationship between ideology and corruption. Um, and my thought was prompted also by the discussion of the uh, color revolution, because I mean, when we interfere in other governments, we at least pay lip service and we, and we think that we are doing it because we genuinely want to spread democracy. Um, when Saudi Arabia interferes, they want to spread Wahhabism, right? Is there any ideology that Russia is trying to spread here? I think, Mike, you're in effect, you've already partly answered the question, which is you think they're just spreading corruption to protect a kleptocracy. I wonder, I mean, I, I had the impression that some other panelists might disagree, so I want to hear some more about it and whether or not any of the old uh, Soviet Union ideology, you know, was, was the Cold War a battle of ideologies on your book, or was it still just, you know, corruption meets democracy? Uh, Thank you. So, uh, I think the Cold War was very much a battle of utopian ideologies. I think 20th century conflicts from uh, the 1930s, the battle between liberalism, fascism, uh, and communism were very much ideological uh, uh, struggles. What we see today is a clash of real-world political systems, not of utopian uh, ideologies. And it is very much uh, kleptocratic authoritarianism versus liberal democracy, the two prevailing models of governance in the world, and why there is, is no coherent authoritarian bloc that takes on liberal democracies, as was the case in the Cold War, there is increasingly coordination, especially between nation states um, uh, and non-state actors, the liberal forces uh, that are non-state actors, to precisely deconstruct the institutions of liberal democracy. Um, I think what's instructive is to look at, for example, the Kremlin's attempted coup d'etat in Montenegro in 2016. Why Montenegro? Uh, of course, Montenegro was on the cusp of, uh, of NATO accession, but Montenegro is a country on the Adriatic, thousands of miles from the nearest Russian border, um, a population 600,000 people, hardly a threat to Russia's strategic interests. Why go to the extent of having the military intelligence service organize a coup d'etat to try to take down the sitting prime minister? Well, because Montenegro, uh, after the collapse of Yugoslavia, became a prime destination for corrupt Russian money. It was a haven of uh, Russian money laundering and investments in real estate. The now well known, thanks to the US political saga, a Russian oligarch Oleg Yerkoska owned a major aluminum plant in Montenegro and has a luxurious $30 million villa there on the coast. Um, so it is the loss of this backyard where Russia has parked its corrupt money that, um, the, in my view, was the driving factor for its intervention there. And since we're on the topic, I'm also going to take issue with my colleague here, uh, respectfully, but Russia has been intervening in Greece and Cyprus for decades. Uh, the Akel party in Cyprus is very closely manipulated by Russia and always has been. That's why the current government, President Anastasiadis, is viewed so skeptically by the Kremlin. They have tried to establish a port in Lima Sol. They've been rebuffed. They clearly view the more pro-American trend under Anastasiadis with concern. And you mentioned yourself, in Greece, uh, the Greeks recently went to the extreme, took the extreme step of expelling Russian spies who were working to fund protests in opposition to the Presta Agreement with North Macedonia. Uh, and there was a Russian oligarch living in Thessaloniki, a man by the name of Ivan Sivitis, 
who was distributing, again, monies to bring people out onto the street. And the Greeks had enough, and they, and they expelled the Russians. The Greek MFA issued a unprecedented, scathing statement decrying Russian interference in Greek internal affairs. So uh, I just beg to differ. I think they're intervening in Southern Europe as well. Well, that's it. They were not intervening. My point was less that they were intervening from an ideological point and more because they have concrete interests that they're trying to to, to push or to defend. I would say that my, my rejoinder to that would be the two overlap. Well, yeah. The ideological and the strategic are, are, are almost one and the same, two sides of the same coin. And, and your point about corruption is well taken, and this goes back to something that Marlene brought up as well, though, is you know, the extent to which Russia corrupts and the West has been willing to aid and abet that corruption. So. You know, Russia didn't compel London bankers and real estate agents to accept Russian money. It didn't compel anyone to, the Troika laundromat, Troika dialogue laundromat, uh, you know, took place. And particularly, again, interestingly enough, in countries politically, Scandinavia, Baltic states that politically aren't particularly aligned with Russia, but you know, that were willing. So, I mean, in some of these corruption issues also, there is the issue of, sure, how much is Russia and how much is our own willingness to, to profit from that corruption when it, uh, or at least individual interests within the United States. And then that goes back to your point, Marlene, about you know, strengthening at home rather than Great. looking overseas. Um, a couple other questions out here. I'll take this gentleman in the front. A couple of others in the Thank you for your presentation. It's Rich Kramer from FBRI. Um, I have a question specifically for you, Ms. Lagerell. Um, I want to unpack some remarks that you made early on. And it's talking about Russia not operating in a vacuum, and as I understood it a little bit, and perhaps I'm reading in too much, so I want to unpack this, but the extent to which it's reacting or responding um, to the West. And the reason why I think that's important is when, when I look at Russia, at least historically, it's been in a sort of place, if you will, reactionary stagnancy for centuries. And then essentially that you, you had a centralized government that's oligarchical in nature, typically rules its citizens by various means of oppression and has a very threatening or threatened view of any country that seems to enter into what it considers to be its sphere of influence. And that may have diminished a little bit in the 19th century in the kind of West following in order, but outside of that, that kind of mode of governance hasn't necessarily changed. So apropos some of the remarks that Nick made earlier, it seems that almost, like pretty much unless you're governing your country in a manner that is viewed by Russia to be similar to their own and you're not entering into their space geographically, then you're by nature some kind of threat. Um, and again, I wanted to explore that a little bit because what I'm fearful of is that when we start to talk about the extent to which Russia is quote unquote responding, I, I'm always fearful that it could lead to this, down this kind of road of an apologetic view like for example, well, you know, what happened in Ukraine? You know, we started to get a little too close, a little too into their sphere, and so we can kind of understand why Russia responded like they did. And, you know, I, being a liberal Democrat and someone who would like to see a free and independent Ukraine, my back gets up a little bit when I start to hear those kind of arguments. So, at any rate, please, for your consideration and response. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. No, I, I agree totally on your point that, and, and Nick made it that, in our vision, there is no sphere of influence, right? It's Ukraine rights to decide where he wants to go and in which uh, regional institution he wants to belong, and we have to support that. What I was trying to say, and I would kind of be careful with this kind of long-term historical parallels, right? Because, I mean, which kind of values were Europe promoting in 18th, 19th century? Which kind of relationship, you, I mean, how you want to interpret that with this kind of imperial Russia, uh, Tsarist regime. I mean, I wouldn't make a kind of too clear parallel. I think things were just quite different. But yeah, Russia is a long-term empire, and it has difficulties moving from an empire, in, imperial vision of its neighborhood to a more nation state. It's nothing specific. All the empires have to go, or post-empire have to go through that, right? The same case for Turkey. It was known for France to also accept the loss of the empire. So I think Russia is still in that process, and what we see in the, the Eurasia region is very much a kind of post-imperial management or mismanagement by Russia of its uh, 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 neighboring. What I was trying to say more is that the, the boundaries of what we call the Western liberal order have been shifting also on our side. 
right? It's not a way to apologize for what Russia is doing or to say that we have to apologize to Russia. But we also have, I think, to put ourselves into the picture and recognize, well, that the invasion of Iraq, that the, 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 the presence in Afghanistan and the kind of shifting narrative from the US between, for example, fighting against Taliban and then recognizing that, well, we failed, so we have to negotiate with them, that the policy of regime change openly formulated toward Iran, for example, today that we were ambiguous on, you know, the eastward extension of NATO. I mean, there have been several elements coming from the West that have been shifting the liberal order from inside and making the kind of boundaries fluctuating. And I think Russia is playing on that because suddenly Russia is also not understanding exactly what are the rules of the game. And as Nick said, Russia wants to be also an agenda setter and not only kind of receiving this rule. So I think they are playing with also issues that we are having on our side on the way, on, because there is a discrepancy between what we say we are and what we do in, in, uh, in a kind of general, uh, 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 on the international scene. So I think they play on that and we also have to recognize that we are part of the way the international liberal order is changing now. Otherwise, we are just ordering Russia if, as if Russia was responsible for everything. While well, I think it's just the world system is changing and we are changing too and making these boundaries blurrier. Great, we had a couple more questions out there. I'll recognize this gentleman over there. And then uh, Adrian. Uh, we've been talking, or you've been talking a lot about the strategic versus the ideological interest. And if you go back to the election of 2016, are we talking about one or the other or a combination was the Russian interference, which has thrown the United States in an uproar for two years, to actually support President Trump because Russia felt they had a strategic interest in supporting President Trump and opposing Secretary Clinton, or was it just to screw with our democracy? And they really didn't care who won. Because the outcome is, I'm not sure they're better off now than they were then. So I'll go ahead and take a crack at that. You know, I my view is very much is that uh, the Russian operation 2016 did not expect to see success. I think their goal was to um, to pump up both uh, uh, not extremes, but both sides, well, far sides of the political spectrum. Yes. So Bernie Sanders was supported by Russian trolls and bots, uh, just as Donald Trump was. <clears throat> Clearly, um, I think they wanted to. Take down Hillary Clinton. That's that's obvious from what we know from the intelligence community's assessment. Uh, they wanted someone who was going to be an anti-establishment candidate who would shake things up uh, and hopefully inject some chaos into our system uh, as a byproduct, uh, which serves their interests. And I think their interests are being served each and every day of this administration. Take issue with your, your um, Adrian. You're Adrian Basora, FPRI. First of all, I think it's an outstanding panel, and I'll stand up so I can see you all. Uh, you've come at it from four quite different perspectives. What I draw, part of there, but there are a lot of common themes despite that. You're saying, all of you have said, of course Russia is working systematically, or working substantially, perhaps not as systematically as others, in this case of Sam, but still working very actively to undermine democracy in the Western call it transatlantic community. Uh, so you're, you're, you're all united on that. So there's been a considerable debate, oh, is it because they want to destroy democracy, or is it because they want to enhance their position in the world, if only by weakening our position in the world? It's clearly both. I think uh, Michael, I believe, uh, showed or, or commented on the overlap between the two motivations. The motivations are very strong. Uh, why they're doing it, is it excusable, or, or are there vulnerabilities that we've created for ourselves that make it attractive? Yes, of course there are. Is, is it partly our fault? Of course it is. Uh, but that doesn't, the, the question of this that underlies the, at least as I interpret the uh, question for this panel is, uh, 
is Russia systematically committed to undermining the Western democracies, whether it's for ideological reasons or whether it is instead exclusively for real politique, power politics, a greater place, a greater influence in Eurasia. Uh, in my view, uh, I agree with Michael that uh, a democracy that actually functions effectively on their borders is an existential threat for both reasons. Uh, and that's why the Orange Revolution was such a powerful uh, call to uh, action for Putin and his regime. So I, I just want to, above all, make that comment with thanks. But I'm wondering if you agree with the common, uh, what, I, what I saw as the common threads, or whether I have uh, misinterpreted the, um, uh, your conclusions. The, the, the ultimate question is, if there is a very deep, uh, is there a very, very deep commitment to undermining democracy in the West, or is it something that could be easily negotiable? I think probably not the latter, but I'd be interested in your views. Um, so, you know, uh, I do think that there's a, it's, we should think hard about this question. I mean, it is a, it is a coherent narrative that, that you hear a lot, that Russia is existentially threatened by the nature of the character of the regime of the states on its border. Um, if that is true, we have to think about why the Russian elite perceives that to be the case. And as far as we can understand from their views of what happened in Ukraine, for example, in 2004, 2005, or in 2014, uh, they don't talk about it in terms of um, popular uprising, uh, and they don't see it as a threat in terms of the nature of the system that emerged. And by the way, in both cases, uh, the uh, democratic credentials of the post-revolutionary regime are subject to debate, you know? I mean, these are not, uh, Ukraine remains a, you know, problematic uh, political system for a number of different reasons and was in 2005 uh, uh, after the Orange Revolution. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, if, if you know, from their lens, this, this idea of a color revolution, a U.S.-inspired attempt to install governments that do its bidding and serve its interests and, you know, undermine Russia's, Yes, there is overlap then in how that, is, how that plays out, but what the primary motive is, is it about the nature of the regime or about the character of the way this state plays in Russian foreign policy interests? I mean, obviously there's overlap when it comes practically, but the way the, you know, the Russian decision makers are seeing this, uh, you know, I think might be different than the way we tend to frame it. And, you know, one other, I mean, you can look at other cases like um, Finland, for example, you know, which borders Russia. Um, I think before uh, the significant uh, uptick in, in the uh, confrontation between Russia and the West, including Finland, that began in 2014, you know, I didn't see uh, the Russian elite that, you know, found that the, the nature of the Finnish political system was an you know, existential threat to Russia. Um, now, granted, obviously, the, the ties between Russia and Ukraine are, are much closer than between Russia and Finland, but um, my point is that I think we need to insert a little bit of nuance into this, uh, to this uh, narrative about um, their fear of infection of, by democracy per se. Now, that's not to say that the Russian uh, regime is not afraid of its own people, uh, or uh, to say that, um, that they, are, they would embrace democracy, uh, but I, I, I'm just not sure that, um, that uh, we can be so confident in their motives uh, being driven by regime type. And that gets to the question about, um, uh, you know, how this might end and can this end. And here, you know, we, we, we were presented with the dichotomy of, uh, quote, a screw with our democracy or uh, merely just get Trump elected. Um, and I think we should add a third option in there, which is sort of screw with us, just generally speaking, regardless of the, the, the character of our regime. And I think, you know, you can see a lot of efforts to do just that in Russian foreign policy these days. Um, and I think because they perceive the way the U.S. is behaving as a threat to them. Now, that doesn't mean that they're right in that uh, perception, but um, or that we should stop doing what we're doing. Uh, but I think that is um, an important uh, thing to keep in mind, which gets to the question of how this might end. Well, the question, which should, I think, also begin with when did this start, really being a serious problem. And clearly, uh, I mean, 2014 was a milestone here. Um, and this interference, uh, really became a problem 
in the context of the broader confrontation between Russia and the West that emerged after the Ukraine crisis. Um, we didn't have this before that. Uh, so it would suggest to me that it, it, you know, uh, it's not uh, intrinsic to um, uh, the Russian uh, system or Russia per se. Um, it might now be, there might now be so much water under the bridge that there's no going back for this particular uh, political system in terms of its relations with the West, that's certainly possible, but um, this has not been going on in, on a continuous line from, you know, the Soviet period to the present. It's just not, there was a whole generation in between that where we did not have this problem. So can I just, I, I want to throw in one thing. I, I, I think we keep this conversation is uh, keep sort of coming back to this, well, is it the regime type that's driving <clears throat> Russian intervention, say, for example, in Ukraine? And to my mind, of course it is, of course it is. But um, did uh, Putin wake up one morning and, and you know, think that, oh, damn it, you know, Prime Minister uh, uh, Gutsen Yuk is gonna quote John Stuart Mill in the Rada, and therefore I need to, you know, intervene militarily? Of course not. I mean, they're not, they're not afraid of, you know, pronouncements of liberal values. What they're concerned about is they're concerned that their corrupt schemes, like Rosso Ergo, which sucked between 15 and 25 billion dollars out of the Ukrainian gas transit system, uh, part of which went to prop up uh, pro-Russian leaders in Ukraine, part of which went back to the Kremlin, that those sorts of schemes would become undermined under a liberal democratic government that wanted to integrate with uh, their own bank structures. They're afraid of that, okay? Uh, is that a product of regime type? Of course it's a product of regime type, because a European integrating country that wants to be liberal democracy with all its warts, and of course, Ukraine is corrupt as hell and has lots of problems, yes, but but that's a problem for the Kremlin. If they can't perpetrate those schemes anymore, it's a lot of bucks that they're forgoing, okay? That's what drove the intervention, in my humble opinion. Would like to add something on that. I don't think that if the regime in Russia was changing and if suddenly the president was no more Putin but Navalny or whoever, I don't think that would change a lot of things. I think that NATO expansion to the, to the east without any kind of articulation of what it means for Russia, whatever the regime will be in Russia, we interpret it as a threat. So I don't think it's a question, I think a democratic regime in Russia in today's conditions would react more or less, maybe they wouldn't have invaded uh, Crimea, but they would react more or less the same way, not understanding what is their room and their relationship to NATO. Because I think NATO mission is ambiguous on its relationship to Russia, and whatever the government in Russia, they will react to that. So I'm not sure. I'm, I think it's more strategic than just the kind of nature of the regime. I'm, I'm not so sure. This notion that this is all a product of NATO enlargement and that the West really failed in the 90s, and you know we we invaded Russia's space, and we should have never you know turned Poland and Czech Republic and Hungary into democracies or helped them to do so themselves. Because after all, it was a demand-driven process. I don't buy that, you know. Um, and you know, we don't have the counterfactual. So I think it's very easy to say, well, if Navalny were in power, he would pursue the same great power claims. We don't know. Putin's been in power since the year 2000. Before that, we had Yeltsin. We've only had two leaders. But if you read, for example, Bill Burns' excellent recent article in The Atlantic, and he's got a new book out. The article's based on the book. Um, Look at what he says about his conversations with Russian leaders about NATO enlargement. This, they were not stomping up and down about this, okay? So, you know, that's a whole other debate, but, uh, but I think it's, it's, it's too easy to just, with a facile, you know, couple sentences slip that in as if that's the driving force. I really don't think it is. And, you know, I want to go to something you said at the beginning of your question, which was about, the, you know, is there, which I interpret to say, is there some sort of bargain, or what, what would be the, the settlement? Well, and I think, you're difficult, what did we get? Well, and I think that it's a bargain that, you know, the bargain that the Russians would jump at would be the one that they kind of thought Prody offered them in 2000, when, when Prody gave the speech and essentially said, the Euro-Atlantic world ends at the proof in the Vistula, right? And then beyond that is a different geopolitical and civilizational world that might have some links to Europe, but, you know, really the Euro-Atlantic world ends here. That's not a bargain we can offer. 
We're not going to say that democracy kind of ends at the Vistula and the Proof, and NATO and the EU end there, and everything beyond the Vistula and the Proof is something else. So in light of that, there are two conclusions. One is, from the Russian side is, or from our side is that this is going to lead to conflict, and that we better be prepared for it. This kind of idea that, well, we'll just keep enlarging uh, and expanding the zone of democracies, and everyone else will just sit back and, and say, well, that's wonderful. I mean, this essentially, this, this should focus a certain realism about our approach to Russia, which is that unless we're willing, and again, it goes back to something Marlene pointed out about the you know, support for politicians in Europe, and even for the interference here. They would love, they, they want, they support movements that say, let's limit the EU, let's stop the European project, the US should come home, come home America, turn inward, because, precisely because uh, the current Western approach is a universal one. Uh, and partly because it's the, it's the impact of the way that they like to do business. And again, the corruption issues, uh, Mike, what you mentioned, there are other governments in the world that, that live with it, that have do business with Russian corruption, and you know, but for the West, that's a problem. I mean, at least for the governments, perhaps not for some of our banks, but uh, um, but I think that there's so that's why I think also why I said about with going ahead to 2020 and beyond. I don't think that there's a compromise. You know, there's a grand bargain. This goes. Sam talked about you know this grand bargain for cyber and the. I don't think we're I don't think we're in a position. They're not in a position to offer, and we're not in a position to offer. So if no bargains on the table. Get your defenses ready. Build them up, and accept the consequences that you know we're in for a rough ride in in Europe and in Eastern Europe uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, and if people can sign up to that, then we can start planning effectively. But. We're not going, 2014, I think, Sam, you're right. 2014 is a turning point, and there is no reset to a pre-2014 relationship between Russia and the West. And long term, either the Russian system folds, or we pull back our ambitions, and we accept the Prodi deal. I, I'm perhaps maybe it's being unfair to Romano Prodi, but that's how his remarks were interpreted in the Kremlin. But, but there's no middle ground right now. If that's the case, then you know, we have to be prepared for all the consequences, including that my assessment is that you know you thought 2016 was a rough, I think we're, we're in for repeats in 2020. Uh, and yeah, if I, if I have a chance, I will ask my question about, is this all intensifying? But actually, I want to go to the audience first yeah. and uh, ask the same lady, officially waiting for the um, thank you very much for coming and for this uh, discussion. Uh, I didn't hear that there was a limit to questions, so I just want to ask two. Uh, my first question has to do with how does U.S. withdrawing from arms, arms treaties affect Russian uh, strategic calculus? Is it an advantage or disadvantage? Um, how will that uh, affect uh, Russia wanting to undermine democracy in the West? And two, my question has to do with to what extent does Russia want to undermine democracy in the West? As we have talked about, there are um, Russian elites who have a lot of money in the West. Uh, possibly undermining democracy and destabilizing society could have an effect on their um, uh, financial holdings here. Uh, so if you, uh, if you could also answer that question, that would be great. Thank you. I'll take the INF question unless you, anyone else wants it. Go ahead. Uh, I, the way that the U.S. has done withdrawal from the INF is a real boon to the Russians because they, we, instead of now having a way to hold them accountable for their violations of the treaty, they're out of it. Uh, and they're doing a very good job in Europe, uh, in European public opinion, particularly in Germany, in painting the United States as the problem. And again, watching the deterioration, I'm, I'm part of something called the Weissach Group, which is a U.S.-German uh, dialogue, and watching over the last two years the extent to which uh, the U.S. position in Germany has eroded so that committed pro-Atlanticist Germans are saying things like Nord Stream, yep, fine, we're going to go ahead with it, and you're as much of a problem or greater. Look, I mean, it's a, it was a boon to the Russians the way it was handled, so I think that, uh, I don't know how what it does for enhancing or undermining democracy, but for driving a wedge between the United States and its European allies, that's... Uh, the gift that keeps on giving for him. 
j just some brief points. I don't think Russia is an exception in weaponizing its financial needs. I mean, China is doing the same all over the world <laughs> with more money to spend to be sure that no one will be criticizing criticiz what it's doing to its own population. Saudi Arabia is doing the same, so I don't think here also it's a specificity of Russia. It's a, maybe a specificity for Europe because Russia is a closed partner, and so we see more kind of Russian money, even if we see a lot of Chinese money and a lot of Emirati money also in Europe. And uh, second point, I mean, until the 2014 crisis, Russia was interested in building coalitions with mainstream European parties. It's only when it failed because of the Ukrainian crisis that Russia had no other choice than to shift to kind of getting support for whoever is ready to support it, which was mostly far right and some far left party. But here, the, the, the Russian strategy was mostly a kind of targeting the mainstream conservative parties in Europe before specifically supporting the far right. So I think on that it's also a sign that the point is not so much ideological. Russia is ready to support whoever is friendly with Russia. It can be mainstream, far right, far left, Wahhabist, Taliban. <laughs> Russia doesn't care about the nature of who is supporting it. It cares about just getting support. And I think uh, that works especially for, for Europe and for the rest of the world, but that works also for the post-Soviet region. Russia will support whoever is ready to be friend with it. All right, other questions? Um, say in the front here. The possibility of blackmail aside, was Putin counting on the fact that Trump would be both incompetent and mercurial? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, that was a rhetorical question. <laughs> I mean, considering that they probably have a lot of intelligence, you know, about before they've heard what well would have known a lot about his personality. Mm -hmm. His first trip to the was to the Soviet Union in '87. That's you know, thirty years of you know, you know. gathering. Uh, question over here, yeah. I'm Jim Hitch, I'm also with FBRI, and, and I lived in Russia and Ukraine from 97 to 2011. I didn't see the 2014, but I was there for the Orange Revolution in Kiev. Um, I'm really concerned about what's going on in Poland and Hungary, and the rise of the strong leaders and the real I think Marlene's point about isn't democracy itself having its own problems, and how I think Nick has pointed out Russia's exploiting all of this. I, I don't, uh, I wasn't aware until we, this morning about the Armenian color revolution and how it's really interesting to see that even if they're pro-Russian at the end of the day, we're still seeing some sort of protests and people rising up and wanting change. I cannot under, understand why Ukraine cannot govern itself by Poroshenko without being impeached, and Timoshenko is the candidate, I mean, what is wrong? Until you get back to sort of this historical, these people don't know what democracy is. I'm sorry, our form of democracy. They may have their ability now because of social media, or the internet, or whatever. I have relatives living in Russia who, who they know what's going on, they didn't know before. And there's a desire for some sort of change. But I'm struck by the point I made in the later that, that it's the oligarchs. It's the vested interest, I can make, that, that make, make this change almost impossible. I mean, we see that now in this country, vest some interests that weren't vested in perhaps, and now found a, a leader and found a base, and there's been a change. But I don't see how it's going to be possible in Russia or Ukraine or Georgia or uh, Armenia, any of these countries, and maybe to a certain extent Poland and Hungary to have change in the way that we would like to say is democracy with freedom of the press, freedom of the, to vote, uh, the courts function without bribes having to be paid all the time, until there's some change in, in, in the way the oligarchs work. So my question is, do you have any reaction to this? What, what a, why do we have this problem in, in Hungary and Poland to begin with? Is it just strong leaders like we have in Brazil and the United States? Is that the, this is the, the nationalist time to do all this? Why do you think there's no progress 
in places like Ukraine that they can't elect leaders? And don't you think that if uh, uh, Nemtsov or others maybe still were alive, there might have been more change, or Navalny is striking something internally that really is going to be an internal pressure because I understand Putin's popularity rating is going down. Maybe the kleptocrats won't let that matter. But any reaction to this, particularly about the the, the sickness of democracy or the weakness? So how do, you, how do you democratize regimes that are oligarch dominated? And corrupt. And corrupt. Corrupt oligarch. Yeah, we can both. Uh, so my, my view is that what Orban has done is essentially he's followed the Putin playbook. He has uh, he has consolidated control of the media. He has stacked the courts and law enforcement. And he has created a system of crony capitalism where most of the major enterprises in Hungary are run by friends of his or those who are associated with, uh, with the Fidesz party. So um, things are trending in the wrong direction. They're becoming oligarchic in Hungary even if they weren't before. Um, I, I truly believe that Orban is corrupt, has been corrupted by Russian interests for years, going back to the 1990s. Um, you should check out Craig Unger's uh, recent book. There's uh, a couple of pages devoted precisely to this topic. Um, and unfortunately, Poland is trending in that direction. I think we, we lump Poland and Hungary in the same category. Frankly, I, I put Hungary, I put Turkey in a category of its own as the most illiberal state in that on that continent, aside from Russia, uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, and then you have Hungary, and then Poland falls into a category where, frankly, you could put the United States. Okay, where you have stacking of uh, judiciaries and constitutional courts by parties of power, uh, but you still have a you have an attempt to uh, demonize certain media, exclude them from covering, for example, the Polish parliament. <coughs> Guess what? We had a president who wanted to exclude a certain media from covering the White House. Um, so similar, and yet uh, the U.S. And, and Poland still have vibrant, pluralistic media ecosystems, civil societies that are incredibly vibrant. Um, Hungary, a little bit less so, but still uh, has a decent civil society. So yeah, I, I don't think we should write them off. I think Poland, you know, in the next election, they could easily flip back to having a, a sort of center left or center right liberal government, and we'll call them a democracy. I, I, I really don't like sort of putting Poland in that same category. Yes, this nationalist populist regime is doing a lot of bad things, but um, it's Hungary where the sort of the, all the institutions of liberal democracy are being emasculated that I find more problematic, and then, as I said, Turkey in a whole other category of, of uh, problematics. So, yes, things are trending in the wrong direction. This is sort of the, it's the hollowing out of liberal democracy by uh, democratically elected leaders. If I can follow on that, I would dissociate the regime level from the public opinion level. At the regime level, I think that indeed what is happening in Poland and Hungary should be separated to Armenia, Ukraine, and whatever. Because Poland and Hungary had truly democratic experience in the 1920s, and as you just said, their presidents are now, or their government is a democratically elected. Maybe they don't stay in power by democracy means, but they got elected by democracy. So this experience is there. So the kind of sickness that we see in Poland and Hungary, I would compare it with what we have in, uh, in Italy, for example, now. So it's part of this EU kind of issues and, and mm, disillusion toward the European Union, but it's thing that is internal to EU membership, right? The fact that other non-EU member post-Soviet, post-communist regime like uh, uh, Ukraine or, or Armenia or whoever are more kind of corrupt and kleptocratic and authoritarian, it's another set because they are not part of this EU world, so their issues are, are different. That said, when you look at public opinion, I invite you to look at the Pew Center uh, uh, research done a few months ago on the rise of illiberal value all over Europe and the Eurasian space. It's really impressive. So they ask, they have about 12 questions about all the different aspects of illiberal values. And then you look at the map, and there is just two worlds, Western Europe and all the post-socialist countries. So all Central Europe, Eastern Europe is exactly in the same color, 
than Russia, Ukraine, Armenia, uh, uh, Georgia. So it's not that you have, in terms of public opinion, liberal values. You have a Western Europe where liberal values are rising, but are still just a plurality among others. And a whole post-socialist world that includes countries that are member of the EU and countries that are not member of the EU, and they are all at the same kind of between 60 and 85 percent of people supporting one of the other in liberal values. And if you look at the, the survey, sometimes Poland, the Polish public opinion is more conservative than the Russian one on several elements. So I think that's also important to understand that there is something which is also just culturally happening on the way the societies are reacting to the changes they had to face these last 30 years. Although I will say I just saw a public opinion poll by Cebos, one of the leading Polish uh, uh, opinion polling agencies from last month. 88% support for the EU, 56% support for LGBT civil unions. So that's that's not what the government is representing. Uh, I mean, the, the, the thing about Poland, the Solidarity Movement always had sort of two faces. It had a nationalist, deeply religious face, and it had a liberal democratic face. And the liberal democratic face was represented by people like Bronisław Geremek and Tadeusz Mazowiecki, and then the nationalist populist face was represented by the Kaczynski brothers um, and, and their camp. And so, uh, you know, for a while they were rowing uh, in the same direction against, uh, against communist dictatorship, against Soviet uh, imperialism, and then, you know, their way split. We have time, I think, for one last question, and then I will give it to the predetermined guy in the back over there. I would say persistent, not determined. <laughs> um, my question is for Mr. Sharaf. You were talking about how we can't just specifically blame interference in the United States election, specifically on Putin himself. Um, this is not a counter, but more of a statement for the question that the, Mark Warner, who is the vice chair of the Intelligence Committee, said that this was an operation directed in by Putin. So what would convince you that this is not an operation that he didn't have like full focus on or he would want full control over? Um, so just to be clear, I said at the outset that um, Putin, in fact, does bear responsibility because um, it's clear that he could shut off effort, any significant efforts like this that were ongoing uh, and chose not to do so. Um, but, uh, and I, you know, uh, I think it's perfectly plausible that uh, some of the more high level, uh, more significant and more uh, directly state-run operations like the uh, hacking and leaking, that um, he was, he approved of it in some way. Um, but, you know, the, the nature of the interference effort was that it was run through many different organizations uh, and seemed at times to be quite um, all over the map. Uh, there was clearly a degree of experimentation going on. Um, and so my point is less about uh, um, Putin's responsibility, which I think is clear, and more about the nature of the Russian system and the way in which actors within it um, often behave with a significant degree uh, of autonomy. That's not to say they go against the leader's wishes, but often it's unclear what those are. Um, and, uh, you know, he can't possibly weigh in on, you know, what kind of Facebook posts the, you know, trolls in St. Petersburg should be putting up on a given day. It's just not, you know, he's, he's but one man, right? So I think uh, my point is more about the nature of the Russian system and what that means in terms of what we can say about interpreting Russian actions uh, that we observe uh, as direct reflections of what the leadership intended. Uh, I think we just have to be careful about that. That's what I was trying to say. Okay, um, I'd like to offer a warm round of applause for it's been an excellent things strictly on time here. We've left uh, plenty of time for all the things we need to do. Our next panel will convene here at 12.30, and that will be Kathleen Hall Jameson and Clint Watts, moderated by my colleague John Haynes at Fort Boston Research Institute.
Um, the, the two panelists um, are people who've written books about um, cyber, uh, cyber interference in elections. And we're going to ask the question, pose the question, you know, have elections become cyber instances of cyber warfare, um, cyber wars? Um, so I would highly encourage you to, to attend that. Um, that will be at 12.30. Um, I, w I did want to offer, uh, again, in my introduction, a, a neglected to offer a thanks in particular to the logistics team who helped us put this together. Uh, in particular, um, Matthew Roth, who is right over here, um, for uh, representing Andrew Mitchell Center. Um, uh, Alina Yakubova, who I don't think is here right now, but representing our department. And also, of course, uh, Maya Otarshvili, who's standing here in the corner, many of you know. Um, not only contributing on the logistics side, but also on you know content and the organization of everything, as did the entire committee. So thank you to all of you who've done an excellent job. And I, I particularly was thinking about that um, when I saw the lunch up here. Um, <laughs> and I thought, man, we really are you know completely firing on all cylinders here. Yes. In what unfortunately would be a meaningless gesture, the House voted 422 to zero to demand the release of the entirety of the special counsel for the public at the conference. Interesting, interesting. Okay, well, um, you know, what's interesting is I, I had actually been planning all along for the report to be issued before this conference. <laughs> <laughs> because my, my intelligent uh, DC contacts were all telling me this, oh, it'll be out next week. Or, you know, so we'll see uh, when we get it. I, I, I don't know. I think it could be a while. But we do know that we have lunch. <laughs> and uh, so we can enjoy that while we can, and we'll come back for the next time. I'll talk to you. And of course, we haven't. Uh, yes, Jeff? Yeah. Uh, we're going to be in these tables for some seating, and we'll be seating outside here as well. But we're going to put people's clothes around these tables and their belongings right on that. Product coat outside. rack over there. Okay, so if you have a coat on these tables, we will remove them to the coat rack. Um, and we will create some seating around the tables, as well as you can, of course, have your lunch at the seat here or in the corridor. Thank you so much. Thanks.